I just want to welcome everybody into this space. First and foremost, thank you guys so much for coming through. Um, we are, it is snowing outside, so Shen is walking through, trudging through that snow. <laughs> um, but yes, hello, so, hello. Hello. Um, yes, so Beyonce and I are uh, the moderators, but I'm also listed as a panelist, so I guess I'll be answering questions as well. Um, and this talk is really just about uh, the intersectionality of being Afro Latinx uh, in the US context of America. Um, and we invite anyone to uh, take, take the space um, as they need it, but also leave enough room for everyone else to also enjoy and be in the mix and love of this space. I'm gonna move my camera down a little bit so you're not seeing my needing to be vacuumed floor. Um, Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. This is better. We like this. Okay. Uh, Beyonce, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, my love? Yeah. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Beyonce Martinez. I'm a freshman and um, I'm a theater and performance major. I'm Dominican. My mom's Dominican and my dad's um, African-American. So I have the best of both worlds. Hey. Oh, I'm just reading the chat. Hold on. Hey. Um. <laughs> So, yeah, and I'm just happy to be here. Awesome, awesome. I forgot that I also didn't give any introduction. <laughs> so thanks for doing that. Um, hi, everyone. I am Naomi Jones. I go by the She series of pronouns. I am a senior creative writing major with a minor in peace and social justice. I do one too many things on campus. Uh, currently, I am the senior class president. I am the president of Ebony. I started my own organization called Black Christians Association. I am also Dominican, Haitian, and, Af and African American or Black. Um, so, yeah, basically, <laughs> uh, we're going to do a quick per. Um, we're going to do a quick introduction of our wonderful panelists. Um, and then I'm going to share a Google form just to collect some resources. Then uh, we'll start talking, start, you know, talking, asking um, questions to the panelists. And of course, you all can ask questions as well. Um, but yeah, I'm going to pass the mic to either Isel or Angel, whoever wants to go first. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Isel. Um, I was, I just graduated in May, class of 2020. I was a theater and performance major, and I'm Dominican. Per. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Angel. I am, I graduated class of 2019 in May, um, and then moved to LA, where I've been ever since. I'm from Boston, um, and I am Puerto Rican and Guatemalan. Yeah, <laughs> interesting little mix. <laughs> um, and I went to school to our city VMA, uh, to focus on production, but now I work at an agency. Per. <laughs> per. Per. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm gonna share that you guys can always contact uh, the moderators or the panelist privately, um, if you would like, or you can just unmute and ask your question or drop it in the chat, you know, whichever you float with. I will also ask that anyone who would like to go around and introduce themselves. Um, we can start with who, whomever and I can make a list or how are we feeling? I'm getting blank stares. So I'm just trying to read the room here. <laughs> I can introduce myself. Hi, everyone. Uh, Samia Jordan, she, her, hers. I'm with Intercultural Student Affairs, and I am just beyond excited that we are having this conversation and that we have uh, the wonderful Isel and Angel with us. They're my kids, even though they're not my, my biological kids. That's true. <laughs> In case you didn't realize that, in case you actually thought they were my kid kids. <laughs> I'm gonna drop a list in the chat. 
um, of like just a random order. Um, I'm writing it out as we go. So the next person on the list is actually Jam. Jam, if you wanna. I choose. Y'all gonna come on through. We just here, come on. Hey y'all, um, my name is Jamaica. I go by the He They series. If we close, we you can call me Jam. If we not, you use my full name. Thank you. Um, I'm the Assistant Director of Intercultural Student Affairs, and I'm just really excited to see the people that I see up on this screen. Shen, if you would like to go. <laughs> can y'all hear me? Yes. All right. Hey, hey, everyone. My name is Shen. He, him, his. I am a Residence Director, Year 4. In a row, represent. Period. Hi, everyone. Oh, wait, Jay, not me, Jay. <laughs> Oops. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Jay. I use the she, they pronouns as of now. Um, I am a sophomore journalism major from Malaysia, and I like Nate, also do one too many things on campus. Next is um, Norma. Hi, sorry guys, I have a toddler around. Um, my name is Norma de la Cruz. Um, I go by the She Series and I, what was the other thing? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Just Anything that you wanna um wanna announce? I mean, oh, and I'm also Dominican. Already... I sell a lot of Dominicans here. Period. We're running through. <laughs> Hi, my name is Silvia Dilanzo. I'm the president of Amigos and treasurer of Raiz. So I am a marketing major, psychology minor. I'm a junior. I, I use a she serious pronouns. And having like this important positions in the Latinx community on campus, I feel that it's really important to be here and support you guys. So I'm pretty excited to hear what you have to say and learn more every day. Diana, you're on mute, my love. Sorry. Um, can you hear me? You're doing a mega, like, I wanna say, I wanna say it's metaphysical, but <laughs> that might be the creative writing major in me. Hi, you can go. you all hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, so hi, I'm Diana. I am the vice president of Amigos. And as Sylvia was saying, we are here to learn more about our Latinx community because we clearly need to learn a lot more than what we know because it's always good to learn different cultures um, and even cultures that are part of our own. So I'm here to listen to everyone and yeah, really excited. Hi everyone, my name is Jalen. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am a marketing communications major, a senior, and a post-colonial studies minor. I'm also a part of Team Intercultural, um, and I'm just so happy to be here today. One, to see Isel and Angel, like I haven't seen y'all in so long, and it's so nice that you're here for this, and I'm just so ready to listen and learn and be present. I'm Nancy. I'm faculty in the Institute. I teach classes on um, interdisciplinary classes on health and science. And I see Isil, who's like one of my favorite students from my plagues and pandemics class. Um, I'm just here to listen and learn. And I'm so excited to see students' faces when I'm not facilitating conversations in class. So bonus. I think it's my turn. Um, my name is Gabe. I'm a junior VMA major. Um, I use the he series of pronouns. Um, and I'm here just to uh, use this opportunity to learn more about each other and to connect with other Emersonians. So, yeah. 
Hello, everyone. I'm Malika Fowler. Um, we go by the She Series, and I'm an assistant director of experiential learning at ELA. So in short, I help advise uh, students on their internship process. When you come out, I'm fairly new to Emerson since the uh, end of August of last year. So I'm just dipping my feet in everywhere I can to learn more about everyone um, at Emerson and all of the diverse opportunities there are. So just here to be open and listen and learn. Hi everyone, I'm Julie Avis Rogers. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm the campus chaplain and director of spiritual life. And I love Tough Topic Tuesday. So I come whenever I can. And this particular topic is one that I don't have all that much personal interaction or experience with. So like others, I'm just really glad to, to listen and learn and be a part of the conversation. Going to share that. Welcome. <laughs> um, so thank you everyone for introducing um, yourself and um, sharing why you decided to join and why you are here and how you are communicating and celebrating in the space with us today. Um, I'm going to pass energy to Beyonce as, as we turn to the purple table. All right. Um, thank you, everybody, again, for being here. It, like, I'm so excited, and I have, like, this adrenaline rush in me right now, and I'm just, I'm in a good place right now. Um, so now we're going to be opening up to the questions, and Naomi and I are going to be asking you a series of questions, and then feel free to unmute or type in the chat if you feel comfortable doing that instead. Um, mm -hmm. So the first question on our on our little sheet is how do you identify yourself and can you talk a little bit more about your personal experience and or journey of coming into your Latinx um, identity. <laughs> um, I identify like I got it so I, I break it down in, like a bunch of different ways because as most of us should be aware we all should know um, race ethnicity nationality they're all different. Um, so I break it down in a bunch of different ways. Um, my race, I'm a Black Latino man, um, and I use like a dash. Uh, I'm not Black and Latino, I'm Black Latino. Um, they're not separate, they're one for me, so I make them one. And my ethnicity, um, I'm Puerto Rican and Guatemala, as I mentioned before, and then my nationality, I'm American. <laughs> um, and for me, coming into my race was probably the hardest part was accepting like the blackness of my own family. Um, my dad's side specifically of the family is where I identify as having my Afro-Latinx roots. And um, it was hard because I just never really understood. Like, I, I feel like growing up, I did, it wasn't talked about in his side of the family as like a, we're black. It was just like, we just happened to be darker. We just happened to have curlier hair. We just like, it just, it just wasn't a thing. It was like this. And I, I feel like that is what makes the culture of Afro-Latinx so unique to the black community is because it's very Latino culture heavy. And like, we like listen to salsa and like reggaeton and things like that. But and it's like different food and everything like that, but they're black. Like when people see my dad, they don't think he's a white man. They don't think he is an Asian man. They, they, they just immediately, they don't even think he is a Latinx man all the time. They are just like, you could be. Um, and that is where it's come for me is because my family doesn't really have, I guess they never really had that understanding themselves to teach it. Um, whereas I kind of had to learn it myself as the years went on, I was like, why are people acting differently? Like, why are, like, I remember the first time I, it came to me was somebody asking me like, oh, why is your dad so tan and you're so light? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, he just looks that way. And I was like, he's just darker than me. I don't know. And I was like, that's where it started to me. I was like, there's a difference. Like we, we looked, we don't look the same. And also I was actually talking to a cell about this recently um we like my hair and things like that like it looks different than other people in my family I have curly or you, you can't see it right now but I have curlier hair um and it just looks different and like that's where it kind of came to me was understanding why the diff there was a difference 
Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Isel, do you want to comment before I interject? Um, yeah, so for me, um, actually my experience is very similar to Angel's. Like I, when I was growing up, there really was no black, white conversation. It was just uh, weird Dominican and that's that. Um, which I mean, I mean that that I mean when you have both have when you have two parents who come from the Dominican Republic, like that's how they're gonna see it because they don't they don't think in terms of I mean, of course, like there is racism on the island. I'm not gonna say there's not, but like they don't really think in terms of black and white like the same way that we do here. It's very like everyone in DR is pretty much like mixed, even like the whitest like looking people or the darkest skinned people, they all have um, ties to like the colonization and the bringing of slaves and all that. So, um, so yeah, when I was growing up, there was no, I wasn't white, but I wasn't black either. I was just Dominican. And, and the thing is, is I look that too. Like I don't look white and I don't really people. The first thing people think is like Dominican or Latinx when they see me, they don't think black or white. They just think like, Latinx um so it can be hard to like try and figure out like what um your race is because being Latino that being Latina is not a race and so when I found that out probably like in high school ish um it just I was very confused um and it took me a long time to really like figure out what exactly I am I mean at the end of the day I'm I'm mixed right I have white blood in me and I have black blood in me um you know colonizers and slaves you know um and basically yeah so I I I've been struggling a little bit especially like I feel like very recently I, I have identify as Afro Latina that's like when people ask me that's what I am um but it's hard sometimes because I'm like well am I I'm mixed right so like what I feel like that's like a whole nother <laughs> it's like a whole nother can of worms because it's like okay you're mixed so do you there are some people who think that if you're mixed you can't identify as black or you can't identify as like you're mixed like yeah, that's a whole separate category but I don't necessarily agree with that but yeah I, I'm sorry for talking so much I could just kind of I love it. I'm like, yes, pour, <laughs> pour out more. Your wisdom, it reaches past generations, both of you. Um, yeah, I completely agree. I think there's so much about Latinx identity that is confuddled <laughs> and changed depending on who you talk to. You can navigate these things differently depending on who you are. And so I thank you both for sharing. I think it's really important to see the, the differentiation in story and where you come from and things like that. Um, to move forward to the next question, um, what do you, what do you define as Afro-Latinx identity? I you know, interesting question. <laughs> so first, I mean, of course, like there's no straightforward answer, right? But I do think there are basically two types of Afro-Latinos, LOL, I'm making this up as I go, but this is what I think. Um, Basically, there are people who are like me and Angel who have like African roots because of, again, history and things like that. Um, so like, I don't like technically, technically, I don't have like an African American, like I don't, I don't identify as African American because I am not African American. I feel like that's a very specific, um, that's an identity that you have here. Like your, your ancestors were brought from Africa to the United States. That is not my experience. And it's a very different experience, I think, um, being African-American than just, and I think black, that's why I identify as black because black is just all encompassing. Um, but then you also have people who are actually African-American and Latinx. Um, so I think for me, that's kind of like where Afro-Latino kind of lies. And then obviously it gets complicated because not everyone who's Dominican will identify or anyone who's, I mostly see it as people in the Caribbean. I don't really see a lot of um, Central Americans or South Americans identi identifying as black, but they definitely are out there. Brazil, I see you. Um, <laughs> but basically, um, but in general, like that's how I would classify it. 
Yeah, I would I would feel the same way too. Like when I when I originally was thinking about I guess this question and like thinking about how I identify, I just I I a part of me does it really simple. Like I'm just like there's like that first step, like physicality. Like there's like people who look like my mom, who's like lighter and you know, less less curly hair. And there's people who look like my dad, who's darker, curlier hair. Like the physical is like the first thing I look at it. I'm like, that's the first step for me. Like that's the, my mind processes that. Obviously that doesn't define people, but that's my first step of being like, okay, there's that difference. Cause that's kind of how I grew to learn into my own identity and um, take into it. And I think, so I think on top of that, there comes with that, that, that physicality with that little, the community is what really connects us to our own blackness because in, especially in America. And I think about that mainly in America because the way black people are seen in America compared to like other places is just like, or just not even compared to other places, black people seen in the world, America too, but we have a lot of issues in America as we all know. And that physicality is what immediately defines you. Um, so I start there and then I go into like the culture of it all, like the little tinier culture things that we deal with. Um, like, in, like I said, it's the same in Puerto Rico. Like if you are darker skin, you're looked at differently. If you are lighter skin, you're looked at better. Um, it's the same way in both places. It's just, that is where it starts first for me. And then it goes into the culture of it all. Like we have specific things that we like listen to or that we're, we tune into um and specific food that we eat I feel like which is also part of the entire country that both countries but it's it just is it's celebrated differently and like I don't know how to explain all that I feel like but for me it's just how you were raised and how you understand tell me about the culture um how you were raised and how you understand your own like a, your own physicality. I feel like that's probably not the best answer and it's definitely not an educated answer. Um, but that's where it always starts for me because I have this a culture that I, like I eat like, like I eat Dominican foods, like I eat mofongo all the time. I eat like mangu all the time. I eat like food like that all the time. And I feel like whenever I eat those food, I look at the people who are making it. They are, they do not look like a light, a very light skinned person. They can be. But I just know I'm always getting this food, like the like arroz con gandules, like the stuff that I have with my family, like the pollo guisado, like all that stuff. Like I, every time I'm eating, that's always from someone who is an Afro Latinx person, and <laughs> and there's just <laughs> there's just that difference, um, and I've always noticed that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you really are making me hungry, but. <laughs> Something, uh, I'm gonna pull this thing from the chat uh, that Shen just put there that I quickly read and I was like, oh, that's good. Um, Shen said, uh, you, you are the knowledge of this information. It ain't your fault. It wasn't part of formal education. Um, so I say that because we look at, I, I, these questions are open questions based off of opinion, based off of how you receive education, how you receive your learning processes, but education is um, interdisciplinary in general and it's multifaceted in the way it can and where it comes from and where it's inspired from. So like, yes, your answer is an educated answer. <laughs> and I will pinpoint that angel <laughs> because you, you have uh, you have this way to understand not even just culture but your upbringing, and that is an experience of which other people can understand something. So that itself is education for someone else. Um, on top of that, <laughs> I for a long time I was going to spiel, but for a long time when I was younger, I always knew that my dad was African American from Chicago, and my mom was. Dominican from the Dominican Republic, La Capital, and I never really thought much into it. I just knew that my mom spoke Spanish and my dad spoke English and I'm that. But then as I grew up, I went to like, um, I went to like a white public, um, pub, uh, public elementary school and the white girls would like always make fun of me for like my braids and um or like my skin or, or just whatever it was and then so for a while I was like oh I don't want to be Dominican I don't want to be black what is that um I want to be white and that's what I that's how I thought for a long long time and 
when I think back, I was like, are you crazy? Like, what's wrong with you? But um, even now, I'm still, I still am faced with people telling me that because I'm Dominican, I'm not Black, that I can't say that I'm Black because I'm Dominican. Or if I'm Dominican and Dominicans are Black, then I'm Afro, Afro, Latina. And, and it's just all these things. I'm just like, no, I am Dominican and I am African-American, I'm Black, I'm Afro-Latina, and it's just that, and it's, uh, I guess, it's, I feel like it's not for people, other people who are not us or me to understand, and it's just the fact that I'm having that constant battle still to this day, even now in this school. <sighs> yes, so that's the tea, but um, all right, so this, our next question is, in your experience, how have you had to deal with anti-Blackness in your community? <laughs> that is a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, um, so you know how I mentioned before that my family just really wasn't educated, that I had to kind of learn and understand it myself. Um, so that's another part of, I guess, educating, or not educating, but having to combat the anti-Blackness in the, in the community. I was like, I'm starting with my family. That's where it starts first. I have to educate all these people, a lot of people, but I have to, like, no one else is talking about it. Why aren't we talking about it? We need to start talking about it. And now, I mean, now I'm viewed as like this person who always corrects everybody, but I'm like, I will gladly do it any day. I don't have a problem with that. And I can talk to you just like this. I'm not top, not yelling at you. I'm not wrong. I'm not fighting with you. I'm just saying that we should, we should think about what we're saying. We should think about how we're acting um, and really process that. And that's where it started for me. It, it's just, that's how I take it. I'm immediately like, oh, but what do you mean by that? <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not, like, what do you mean? Like, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean to you. I'm not trying to be rude to you. I'm asking you like, what are you, your thoughts on that? Like, okay. Like I, I had a conversation with my, first with my parents, that was where it started. Was explaining to the, <laughs> explaining to my dad why people have called him the N word, why he's been pulled over by the police, like things like that. I've had to explain to him. And when he came, this past year when he came to LA was when I was moving and it was during a lot of the riots that were happening. And he was like seeing all the police and everything. And he was like, what's going on? And I was like, like, that's just, that's, that's what happens. Like if you were to walk out right now, they would be looking at you crazy too. Um, and <laughs> just the police just in general. And I think with the anti-blackness, I just always stop them. I'm like, okay, what do you mean by that? Like, and then I and then I goes and I bring because I always try to bring it back to the idea of but you're black. What are you doing? Um, and it just kind of I want to preach for them, like to love themselves. So I want to get back to that point. So it's like there's a first step is what are you doing? The second step is but you're black. It kind of you're contradicting your own self. And then the third step is like okay, but you need to learn how to love yourself because what you're saying is basically against yourself. And that's what I like to do. Um, for me, a lot of like my family, my family is dark skin. Like my dad's side is like, they be walking down the street. There's no way anyone's thinking they're anything but black. So, but you know, they all, my aunts and then my dad, and then they all came from the Dominican Republic. So I, I do think it's an adjustment. I will say, I think my dad is now just learning. He's been in this country since he was 16. He's like 48 now. I think he's now just learning that he is viewed as a black man in America, which is wild, but it takes time. And it takes like, if you're not actively working on it and like for the most part, no one in my family has been actively working on like, figuring out who they are because in their minds they already have that figured out they're dominican that that's it like there's no there's no black and white gray area like it's just that um and like for them it's like at least for my dad specifically because i've talked to him um he's like i don't care what anyone else like in his head he's like well i know who i am like who cares what everyone else sees me as um 
but in America, a lot of like what your identity is kind of has to do with your physical look and the way that other people see you. Like it doesn't matter if you um, identify as also um, like that makes me think of a, like a lot of like mixed people, like mixed famous people. Like um, it doesn't matter if you are mixed, like if you look black, people are just going to assume you're black. Um, and so there's that and then like a lot of like the anti-blackness in my family specifically has to do with being anti-Haitian and um it's a conversation I remember I called out I think it was my aunt because she made this post on Facebook and I was like what is this craziness that is coming out of your mouth ma'am and I just was like, no, 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 no. So I was like, we're pulling it back. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about this. And Facebook is probably not the best place to talk about this, but I was like, if you're bold enough to post this on your page, we're gonna talk. Um, so I don't know what, I mean, I do know the history, right? Because like, I'd be looking up history facts, but I really don't understand. If anything, Haitians have every right to be upset with Dominicans. I don't really know why um, Dominicans be hating, but it just, again, it just has to do with anti-Blackness though, right? Because most Dominicans look like me. They, we have, we're not, like we're such a, it's such a range of color. Whereas in Haiti, most people are just black. Like th there's not really a lot of light skins. Now there are, cause I mean, that's how life is. But like in general, like there's, I have cousins who like have light skin, green eyes. And then I also have cousins who like, if they're walking down the street and they're pulled over by the cops, they will just be assumed that they are black. So it's just like, that range and I don't really think Haiti has that range so then I guess like ooh, like Dominicans will just look down at Haiti because they're darker and that they're black and then they they don't speak Spanish well actually most Haitians do speak Spanish but um but like their language is like French Creole and it's like I really don't my thing and so I'm gonna bring it back to the Facebook post I don't really remember what exactly her post was but I was like I don't understand how we because this is when Trump was still president gross um I was like I don't know how y'all can be anti-Trump and talking about how he uses all these generalizations and then generalize all of Haiti like what how can you be like all oh, Haitian people? I'm like, no, everyone is an individual person. Everyone has their individual feelings. Everyone's going through their own story, their own narrative. Like you can't generalize all people. And I'm like, is that your anti-blackness showing? It is. Um, so yeah, I've had conversation. Most of my conversations, at least with my family specifically has to do with being like the way that um, our family sees Haitian people. Still working on it but that's mostly where it comes from <laughs> i just have a quick thing to say like my mind has been like this girl has been turning but the internalized racism that is a thing and internalized oppression that is a thing i myself like i said earlier like i when i was little, i wanted to be white with freckles and blonde hair blue eyes all that like i wanted to be white and it's just like a lot of my family also, like, I can see, like, by the things that they say, like, my my younger sister, the, my youngest one, she's dark-skinned. She's darker than me. And my middle sister, she's lighter than me. And then I'm, I'm caramel brown. And um, I, just the things that my grandparents say to my younger sister and, and telling her that she's too dark, that she, she's black and that's not cute. And, like, all these things, it's just, like, I see how that's causing that, sorry, damage to her and, um, yeah, it just brought up a lot of stuff for me, but oof. Yeah. <sighs> so our next question. Um, so the way the US has constructed race places people within boxes and categories, categorize uh, categorizes individuals. So how does it make you feel that people do not hold space for you um for your intersectional identity? Well, I mean, it's definitely hard because some people like, like don't really know what that is or what like that means, but it's kind of like, I don't ever feel alone because I feel like that's the case with so many 
um, identities. Like it's not just Afro Latinx. Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, like I feel like mixed people, any type of mixed person definitely has that battle with identity as well. Um, so like, I mean, it sucks, but like is to be expected. I don't know how to else to explain it. Like, I feel like anytime I talk to someone or like they ask me anything about like my background, um, it's just like, I just know it's gonna take much longer for me to explain things and like to tell people like how it is um, because maybe I don't look a certain way to them or like I don't fit that box that they have. They don't, I don't fix, like a perfect box that has already been um, presented like as a thing that you can check off on the census or whatever. Um, but it's like, I, I'm almost 23. Like it's been, this has been my whole life basically. So it's, it's to be expected, I guess. I'm just gonna repeat the question really fast. Um, so, um, the way the U.S. has constructed race places people within boxes and categorizes individuals. So the question is, how does it make you feel that people do not hold space for you um, for your intersectional identity? Um, <laughs> I hate like the, I mean, I don't hate it, but I'm always like, okay, I'm gonna like, whenever I check a box, I'm always looking at it and I, and it, it, it like, is so, I don't know why, maybe I just haven't been educated on it yet, but like the, how they're like, there's like a different section for if you're Hispanic or Latino. Um, and it's like, a, it's its own like thing that just floats in the air and the paper or whatever, like it just does its own thing. I'm always so confused because <laughs> in my head, I'm like, I, I always pick black or if they have multi-race, I always pick both, I always pick both. Um, that, but I'm like, what if like they're, I don't know if they're like, what do lighter skin be <laughs> like do they really click have to click white like i'm like what that, that always baffles me because i'm like i don't i'm like i want to click both like i want to be like black latina boom great that did it but i'm like it's like a separate section of it and i'm like yeah because then and sometimes it always specifies to black and then it says but not of hispanic or bitter descent and i'm like what does that even mean i'm like so where's my section? <laughs> like, do I click nothing? And then do I only just skip to the next part? Like, I'm always so confused on that. And I always just, I'm just picking black. And then they say, but not of, and I still click the Hispanic anyways, because I'm like, <laughs> what do I, what do I click? Um, so when I think of that, I'm like, yeah, I, I feel like it's hard to like, be out there like how, like that's it's just like seen as like not a thing where it should just be a thing i i think honestly that hispanic section like just needs to be dissolved and either put in the section or just need to be made more clear in those sections when people are clicking if they're going to click something if they need to know your race so badly then it needs to be more specified because it just it confuses people and like i said i'm like do lighter skin people like or people that are just whiter latinx people do they do they click like white and then they click like hispanic like like i'm like how does that work because like i would hate to be in that position i as well like it's like both positions i'm like they don't make sense to me um and it's just not seen so i think when it comes to these categories it's just like i'm just not there i'm just like a I'm floating in the abyss somewhere and i have to like click different things like I'd be playing around sometimes, like click multiracial, two racial, like I'm like, woo, like, cause I'm not there and that sucks, but yeah. Naomi, do you wanna add anything? I, especially in this school, in this institution, I've had to also create my own safe space, especially within my classrooms, because being a theater and performance major, it's all about being comfortable with the people you are working together, collaboration and um, being vulnerable with people and talking about tough shit. But how can you talk about that kind of stuff if you look around and you're the only person in the classroom that is black or that is um, Latina? And it's exactly, <laughs> exactly. And it's like, First semester, I was really, I, yeah, I'm gonna say hated. I hated it here. I didn't feel um, that I belonged at Emerson. I wanted to come to the school so badly, fought months with Emerson just so I can be able to afford to get here. And then I came here and I'm just like, ooh, 
<laughs> no mom I can't be here and um it was uh it was a battle within myself but I decided to stay thank god that I I did because I I've learned about about Popeyes and Pop Off, which I joined my first one last week. And I was like, oh my God, we had that, that kind of thing here. I learned about Ebony and all these other organizations here. And um I I feel I feel like I have a community of people here. So yes. So our furthermore, how do you create that space for yourself in your greater community? I kind of feel like we we answer some of those questions but if anybody else wants to it's our angel Naomi if you want to add on to anything else I'm sorry I was reading the chat yeah <laughs> <laughs> no um that's just how do you create that space for yourself um and your greater community um that's so funny that you mentioned Popeyes and Pop Off. Um, I was on Ebony's executive board the first year we created that. Um, so it's like, hey, so I was so happy because I was like, it's still a thing, it's still thriving. Um, I love Popeyes and Pop Off. Um, and, but that's a, that's another thing. I guess like when I was at, I can speak to when I was at Emerson specifically. When I was at Emerson, my thing was being a part of these, <laughs> um, being a part of these organizations, like Ebony specifically. I joined Ebony because I was like, this is where I feel at home. These are the people that I want to talk to. These are the things I want to talk about. These are the, what I want to connect myself with. Um, and then further to that, um, I was like, I'm physically living on campus. Like, I'm not always, I'm not living in the cultural center. I'm not living with Ebony people. I'm not like, I, I could have, but I wasn't. Like, I was like, I'm living here. So for me, it came to also like, I need um, to be a part of like that as well. Like create a space for where I live. And then I became an RA. Um, and I was like, I need to become an RA because I need people like me <laughs> um, out here. Because when I was a uh, freshman, my, one of my RAs was a black woman and then one was a white man. And I was like, okay, at least I have her. You know, it was super chill and she was great. And she introduced me to Ebony. Um, but I would always walk in and I'd be like, look at like all, like, because they have the faces of the, all the RAs. I don't know if they still do that. Shen. Um, I don't know if they still do that. But no, I don't know if they still do that. <laughs> so I'm just saying. Um, but they had like all the faces and... Um, I would always be like walking into little building when it was the old little building uh, and be like, geez, like all these my RAs, like it doesn't feel like a home. I was like, I want to feel like I'm at home. I want other people to feel that way as well. Um, <laughs> oh, um, so I was like, I wanted to feel that way when I walked in and I was like, I need to become an RA. I need to like do this also because of what you said as well. I couldn't afford to go to school. And that was a struggle as well. And I was like, I, like, I, I, the main thing realistically was me needing to be able to afford to go here. And I was like, if I can afford to go here, great. I can be an RA, make things much easier. And then the second part was like, I just, I have to make that space for myself and become an, R, an RA gave me some type of power. Like I was like, I can literally make the space. Becoming the VP of Ebony gave me power. Like I was like, I can literally make these spaces and not just for me, but for other people. Um, and I just seek out that power constantly. I seek it out in myself. I create my own table. I'm like, I don't want to see at your table. I don't want that. I'm like, I want my own table, I want my own space. Um, and that's just what it was. And I was like, I need to constantly be preaching and putting it out there. Like I am this, I am that unapologetically and just push it forward. Tell them what you did at your job, Angel. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> why do you put on the spot like that? Why you give me no the <laughs> Because I have no examples, so go. <laughs> okay. Um, so I guess at my job, um, I went to a PWI and then I moved on to a white owned white company. Um, and I was like, I need to continue to make these faces. Um, and I knew I was like, I have to be really smart because these, this is my job. Like I can't like fuck it up. Um, and sorry, excuse my language. I know this is being recorded. Um, but I was like, I can't mess this up. Like, I need to like, this is a part of, like, this is serious. I can get fired. Like, I don't want to mess anything up. But I was also like, 
how can I get fired? I'm like doing the right thing. And so it just took me some time at first. Like I was like, I need to sit down, settle in with the company, like get to know people, let people know who Angel is. Like I got my, I eventually became an assistant because I started out as a floater. I became an assistant. I, I was like, okay, okay. And then it really started for me was Black History Month last year. Um, last year, Black History Month, they, I had a feeling they weren't going to do anything. And for the past four years before that, I always planned something or always planned Black History Month at Ebony, uh, with Ebony. So I was like, I need to do, we need to do something. I was like, we're not doing anything. So I talked to HR and I was like, hey, like, if we're not doing anything, that's on y'all, but I'm just going to do something myself. Um, I'm going to order a bunch of food and have it at my desk so people can come eat it. And it's going to be from a black owned place. And I'm going to set up a little donation drive and, you know, do a Venmo account and have people just, if they want to do it, they can do it. And that's how it started. From there, they were like, oh, actually we can approve it. We're going to fund it. We're going to do it. It's going to be company wide, LA, New York. Like it was a whole thing. So we started like a donation drive Unfortunately, it was at the end of the month, but we just did, did a donation drive and then had like a party to celebrate Black History Month. And they catered it with a black owned bakery with a like they bought a bunch of stuff. Um, and that's how it started. And then time went on, Corona happened. We moved on and June happened. And when June is where I was like, no, we, I, I can't continue to be so silent, I guess. Um, and we had a conversation. We went to our Monday meeting, which we always have, and everybody started talking in business as usual. And someone spoke out and was like, there are people that like are affected by what happened this weekend. Like, are we going to talk about that? Um, and then so they, they started talking and I was like, yeah, we need to have a space. Like, we need to create something for people like myself. We need to, like, I'm not acknowledged enough. Like, I... My identity is acknowledged enough. The people like me are acknowledged enough. I look in this room and I told everybody, I was like, I'm on this Zoom right now with a bunch of white people who probably don't care about anything I have to say, but I'm going to say it anyways. And I'm sorry if I get fired for this, but I need to be seen. I need to be heard. And the next day was Blackout Tuesday. And I was like, that's a thing. We're not doing that at this company. We should be. And they did eventually do it. Um, but from there, it became a conversation with me and two other assistants of color, and we created what's called now the Diversity Task Force. So it's basically our company doesn't have any diversity inclusion initiatives, any diversity inclusion, nothing. Um, so we created a diversity task force. We brought it to, I work at a family owned company, the Gersh Agency, which is owned by the Gershes. So I, we brought it to them and we, they, we pitched everything. We created mission statements, we created committees, we created uh, like a goals, plans, we created everything on, on Blackout Tuesday. We took the day off to do that. And we went to them and it's been go growing from there. We hired somebody to do diversity and inclusion. We got on 10 agents to join us. Um, one of them being one of the Gersh's. Um, and now we have like a whole board of people who meet and talk about how we can make the company more diverse and inclusive. Um, and just more recently, I, again, again, planned all of Black History Month again, and it just went out to the company um, for this month, and it's finally a full month instead of a week. Um, and I worked with some people in HR and some, some assistants, and now they backed me up. But like, it's been a thing where we just have continuously met weekly, and we're trying to make the company a better place. It's not just an all PLC um, member, organization but it is something that started and is only in place just because we need to have better standards better policies better everything in place for people of color at the company um it's, i haven't read any of these chats because i'm trying to stay focused but um it's just been continuous from there the agents respect me but at this point also i've i've already mentioned to them my neck is out at the company like everyone knows, like I send out everything diverse and inclusion related. I was handling all of that stuff. And now I'm just like in charge of it, I guess. But I'm like trying to like work with other people because it's a lot of work. Um, this is the company. This is the company. Like I don't own this company. This is the company of over 200 people. I, I don't have. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Let, let me interrupt and give you an idea. Um, mm -hmm. Since you're doing the work, you may want to write up your own job description based on what is an industry standard and present it to management. To, to see if you can get paid to do that and strengthen the uh, organization as well as put the um, money in your pocket. That is actually my next step. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up because that's where I was going to go next is we're going to hire somebody to be the diversity inclusion person in HR. However, I want to work as well on that. Um, so I want, and I don't think I can be that person because they want somebody who's had like 30 years of experience with this. 
Um, but I do want to be like the coordinator, at least the assistant to them, the, like, helping them out and doing that work. Um, so that's actually my next step. Um, I, I hope to, since I plan Black History Month, I'm currently planning Women's History Month and I'm gonna go into Pride and anything else in between that. Um, and I want to have that be its own, like suffice of like, I'm running this whole thing for a year now. And by June is really it for me. I'm gonna be like, okay, I need to have this position now and we'll see what they do. But um, well, if not, I'll be taking my business elsewhere. Um, Realistically. <laughs> period. I period. <laughs> There's a lot happening. <laughs> ah, Angel is glad that I told you to speak up. <laughs> yeah. Well. Sorry, you can go ahead. I'm not, I have nothing to add. That was perfect. <laughs> I'm just trying to read the chat. I'm like, now, now let Angel catch up on the chat. Um, Issa, do you want to touch on how you further create space um, for yourself and your greater community? I mean, it's just like, I mean, like, again, like I could talk about my time at Emerson, but like that was, then and I mean I could talk about it but in my like now like that I'm like graduated I'm out here I live in LA now if anyone I'm originally from Boston live in LA now um currently unemployed just like living in my apartment um working on me like like I don't know it's hard because like right now I'm just trying to figure out my life so I'm not even like really focused on like what that creating space is I feel like once I get so like the thing is is like you really don't have to create space for yourself until you get somewhere and then you kind of like vibe it out and then you're like okay um like in my head I'm like well me being who I am it's like an expectation right like I don't expect to go anywhere and be like have the space already laid out for me and like well like if that were to happen I would that would be that would be wild. I like to come in and like have this space already created is not expected. So like depending on wherever I go, wherever I end up, like it's kind of like already in my head that like I'm probably gonna have to do this work, um, which is sad, but I feel like a lot of people probably feel that way. Um, and like, like I would assume like any, uh, especially like I think especially like black people in the United States, especially when they go into a space like Angel was mentioning, like a workspace that is predominantly white, um, it can definitely be hard. So it's like expected, but like, I don't really have any like concrete things that I'm currently doing because I don't need to be doing that because my space is my house and I, I get to control that. So period. Yeah. <laughs> Take care of yourself is resistance and is a form of self-justice. So let that be said. Um, first of all, thank you both for, uh, and, and Beyonce, and thank you so much to everyone for coming through, giving your truth and holding this space. As, as we can tell, there is so much more to impact here and there, we've literally only ba barely scratched the surface with things to talk about. And this discussion will continue, which means we will have a part two. Um, but I will, I, I will have to close this out so that we can get people to their meetings and off to class and everything like that. But thank you again for coming through. Um, and if you need anything, don't hesitate to reach out.